Very good morning. Was everybody? Yeah, I got a thumbs up and a good. That's that's not bad. I think I pulled a muscle in my leg. It's so embarrassing though that I was at softball practice last night um, for my daughter, and uh, the coach we were short a player, and he's like, "We need one of them, one of you, the coaches, to go out there and play." And I was like, "Oh, I can do this. Like, I'm in good shape. Okay, all right." And I think I pulled a muscle in my leg all night. I was like. It's like the pain of shame right there. Uh, I feel like I'm hobbling. I'm like, oh, I hope I didn't ruin it too bad. I have stuff to do right now. And we have like a game today and a game tomorrow and a game Friday. So a lot of softball this week. Anyway, uh, I hope everyone is hanging in there. I wrote reminders up there, the same reminders as last time, but uh, you know, they're obviously getting more, a little more like pressing, right? The paper due today, the exam on Monday, and then uh no class the next Wednesday. So I'll talk about that again at the end, just to kind of go through that and see if anyone has any questions about any of those things. But I put them up there just to keep them on your mind. Uh, otherwise, what we'll do is we'll kind of jump back into where we left off. And as I said, not a super long uh, chapter. We're really kind of focusing on the disorders on this slide. And they do have another little case study that we'll do, I think is a nice way to bring um, all of it together. Uh, so we might we might be done a little bit early, depending on how long it takes us to get get through it. Uh, but are there any questions for now? Again, I'm going to talk about those things at the end. But any anything like on your mind at the moment? Yeah. So with the work side, we want to suggest how to like lean him down and still know what lean is. So two thoughts. Uh, Make sure it says references. It doesn't matter now, but for APA formatting, it should say references. Um, but for now, what I want you to do, I'm not worried about APA formatting until we get to the final paper, but try to like cite the source as best as you can, or at least give me all the information for the source, um, even if it's not necessarily in the correct format. So let's say you use the DSM, like American and Psychiatric Association and Diagnostic, you know, like and try and write it all out. And then also make sure you include your show, right? Uh, I won't take points off if you don't now, but in the final paper, your show should also be on the reference. So it's like maybe your love for a character, or, you know, whatever character, the character show. Like references to. For, oh, no, like your, the citation for the show should be on the references in the final paper. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm not going to be worried about EPA format for this one. The final paper of the way it gets. And we'll talk about that more uh, after spring break. Start off. I think I'm not having high expectations of that, but there's a few things like a references page and having some latex citations and a cover page that I want you to try. Um, other than that, not much, but I'll, I'll talk about that. Make sure you know exactly what I'm looking for in the final. Yeah. I just want to ask for developing really great curiosity to the best. Sure. So the part of the abstract is that no. <laughs> so your paper, I know six to eight pages doesn't seem short, but it's short. Uh, in terms of uh of like APA style, maybe it was wrong. No, so typically like 20 pages or more, you you end up with like a little abstract. You can do it if you want to, it's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to uh, you don't need to do like keywords in an abstract. Um, right. so my master's thesis was 130 pages, and so that one had an abstract. Great. Right. Um, and then we'll say, oh, the abstract's so nice and so brief, right? I love abstracts because you get a nice yeah. snippet, but you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. You're more than welcome to do it if you want to. Okay. And I want to point out, um, I guess we can talk about this now since we're here, and it sounds like there are a few questions. If you go to Canvas, I just want to show you this because I think it's a good resource, and I put these up a few years ago, and I think it will be helpful for you. If you click on modules, sorry, it's way over here. Um, and you scroll down. So here's the instructions for the paper, right? So this is where you're uh, getting those kind of general instructions. Notice underneath them, I have what, two, four, five sample papers. Thank you. That are on here. So if you're going like, I'm not sure how I want to format this paper. I'm not sure what you're looking for in the end. These are papers that have been turned into me in the past that were really strong. They all got A's. And so like, for example, let's do Hook, uh, which was kind of a unique character, right? Unique paper. So if you click on it, you can see how somebody approached the, the final paper. And this might give you some ideas for what to do. So here they did like a, a title page. They have their title and then um, that information. And then you can just see the paper after it. And then when we get down to it, if we keep going, here's the references page. And they only have two, right? They have their show. And then they had um, an article or a book that they, a book that they found. 
So if you want to look at these, it might be really helpful for you in getting an idea of how people like approach that final paper. And they're all a little bit different, and but they're all papers that were really strong. They were really good ones. Yeah. No, no. Like, and then I'm not going to be like crazy about that. This class isn't about EPA format. It was my research methods class, a little different. Uh, but I just want you to have an academic source. And I, you'll probably use it for like your criteria. When you're talking about what disorder you think your character has, you, you're going to need to get that from somewhere, uh, the criteria piece. And that'll probably be from your source, which is why the DSM is such a good one to use. right? But no, you don't have to cite every scene or uh, online or in person. Really, uh, if you ask the librarian, it's usually in the reference section. You can't check it out. Uh, Huh. Yeah, they're right there in the front. Ask one of them. Okay. And um, it should be there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. It's there. Okay. Uh, if you ask one of the librarians, they'll literally walk you right over to it, which is really convenient. That's all they do all day. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, we can't legally help you with that. What? Oh. <laughs> I wonder if they misunderstood. She thought you wanted to diagnose her or something, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Sounds funny. Okay. So just be cautious of online versions of the DSM. They're almost never good. Yeah, almost right never. Now. That's oh. okay. Yeah, that's okay. It's a, yeah, it's okay. yeah, if you find it through a, like our library, it's fine. And I had a link on here of it, um, but I think it's been broken. Um, I think there was bad, but I found another one to go through the library. Okay. Too, which is why I've got it. Yeah, the library just went through this huge overhaul of their system and they updated everything. So I'm pretty sure my library resources need to be updated as well. Um, it was just recently, but um, I did have a link to it right here. But yeah, be careful unless it's through like our college, online versions of the DSM are usually kind of sketchy. Um, so it's probably better if you just go find it, take a few pictures of the pages that are relevant to you, um, and then you can cite that or find it through the library. And it's great too. Uh, if you find, if you remember the link or remember, um, email it to me. If you do, no pressure, you don't have to like spend a bunch of time on it, but if you find it, that'd be great. So um, sample papers. There's also a couple other things that are going to be really helpful for you, maybe not for this part, but for the final paper. So um, there's this great handout that the Writing Center put together. So I used to have them come in before COVID. They would come in and we'd do a whole presentation on APA. Um, I recorded it, and I'll show you where that is in a moment. Uh, but they have a whole handout that they made. It tells you how to cite the DSM. It was catered to this assignment. So it's really, um, I think, helpful. Um, they did a presentation. Here's their slides some library resources. And then um, if you go all the way down, how many classes we've had, right? All the way down here, um, there's a video of library resources and APA way down here. And so the librarian, Danielle Caprellian, made a whole video on how to find academic sources through the library online. Um, and then they made a little update, which I added. Um, and then here is a whole thing from the Writing Center about APA formatting. So these are things that might be really helpful for you. This second one, probably more helpful for the final paper. And then this first one, more helpful for this part of the paper. If you're like, I don't know how to find a source in the library. I don't know what an academic source is. She went over all of that. Uh, we kind of planned the presentation together. So there's a lot of resources that I've put together on here for you. That's all the way at the bottom down here, along with a mindfulness training from the health center that they recorded. Um, or the instructions and all that are, are up here. So just a, a couple of things if you're if you're needing a little bit more help. And I think I mentioned this before too, if you ever want to send me a rough draft before the final is due, I'm happy to read it and give you some back. Be like, hey, you're missing this, you're missing that, or this is perfect. Uh, you're welcome to do that all the way up to like a couple of days before it's due. This one I don't think is as stressful. The biggest thing, again, 10 points of that 40, is having an academic source. So please don't forget to do that, right? Make sure you have an academic source and give me the information for it. Don't just write like DSM somewhere randomly in your paper. I won't see it. Uh, put it on like at the end of the, the references. Yeah. So at the end, I have a paragraph explaining services. Is that good? Yeah. Uh, what I would do instead is like write references and then like put the citation in. Like make it really 
obviously there's no missing it. And that's only going to help you for the final reader anyway, because you'll have it already written. Yeah. Does the academic source have to be a book or can it be a website? So it can be a journal article um, or it can be a book or it could be like the DSM. Generally, websites are a little questionable. Like if you want to check a website with me, you could. But anything that's .com, .org, even .gov, like if you put that on there, I'm going to give you half credit for the source. So I would make sure you have a textbook, uh, like a book um, or the DSM or an article. If that helps. Yeah. I'm pretty sure mine was article, but I found it to the Wolf Park College Library. Yeah. Do. Yeah. So if you have like the whole like, um, you know, web address or URL or whatever for like an article that you found through our website, that's different. That's fine. Okay. Uh, but if you put like, I mean, obviously not academic, like Wikipedia as your um, as your source, like let's say you really want to use Wikipedia, that's fine. Or Internet Movie Database or something. Totally fine. Just make sure you also have an academic source. You can use more than one. You only need one. You can use more. Most people just have one. And <laughs> you're welcome to have a few. So that's too bad tonight. Uh, I'm going to try my best to grade them all before I go, just because I know you'll be anxious about your score. And I don't want them beating over my head either when they come back. Um, so I'm going to try my best to grade them or as, as many of them as possible. And then remember, on Monday, we do have our second exam. Right? So you have a study guide that's on here if you scroll up or down, depending here we are, down. So it's right here, study guide number two. And this exam, uh, the exams in here are never cumulative. So this one's on everything since the last test. So chapter eight, six, seven, nine, and 10, which we'll finish today. So out of order, but in the order that we, we covered them, just to make it simpler. So again, make sure you know everything that's on here. If it's on here, it will be on the test. If it's not on here, you don't need to worry about it. And um, it's open note and open book, but definitely prepare and study like you would for a normal test. It'll open Monday morning and close Monday night. Uh, I won't be grading the short answer. I'm not taking my computer with me because there's no internet whatsoever. Um, even if you pay for it, it's stupid. There's no internet on the boat. Uh, so I'm not gonna be able to grade them till I come back, but you'll get a score for everything else uh, once you hit submit. And then on Wednesday, there will be a little assignment that will pop up um, on here to do since we won't have, have class. Okay. So just to make sure, any other questions, anything else about any of this? Uh, there were a lot of questions, so I just figured we'd just jump into it. But any other questions about the paper, the exam, the new class on Wednesday, and all that? Is that almost again? No, okay. <laughs> anything? Are we okay? All right. Three days and two hours. I'm just, I'm just kidding. All right. Not really. That's that's actually what it is. But uh, sorry to keep bringing it up. Right. I'm a little excited. Just just a little bit. I know. I'm, one of the girls on my daughter's softball team is going to Italy on Saturday. I was like, "You're going to Italy?" She's like, "Yeah, I went to Australia last spring break." I'm like, "I kind of hate you. Low key hate you right now." Uh, but her dad's a pilot, so I guess they go all over the place. But. But yeah, it's fun to go anywhere. Is anyone else doing anything fun over spring break or coming up? Anyone going anywhere? Doing anything fun? You want to share? Or, or, yeah. It's Florida, Orlando. Nice. Yeah. I know. I don't want to go to Florida, but I mean, it's still nice to go on vacation. So. Yeah. I'm flying to Florida in November. I hope I don't die, but that's okay. You know, I mean, I went to Texas last year and survived barely. That's fun. Yeah. Maybe Vegas because that's like my mom's place and she's a Trump official, so I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Hopefully. I hope you go. That sounds like fun. I love Vegas. So many restaurants in Vegas, oh, right? So I don't only care about the food everywhere I go. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. How long is that flight? How long flight? Is? Ten hours. Ooh, that's a long time. Lots of books to read or something, right? At the yeah, end. Exactly. How fun, but right? I've never been. I've always wanted to go. Wait until we kids are a little older. Yeah, you know what I mean? Oh, really? Oh, look at it. Like, meet up in London. Right? Anybody else? Anything else going on? Yeah, it's a hard one to follow. Yeah, it's definitely not London. No more no to friends out there. It's all the That's fun, though. It's nice. And sweet, right? It's so sappy. I love it. I love to the whole family. Right on. How fun. Anybody else? I'll eat something for each one of you. 
<laughs> I consider it like that, right? There's like 30 something of you. I think I could eat one croissant for each of you and be okay, right? All right, and then maybe one soft serve ice cream for everyone in my next class. Then I've covered everyone, right? <laughs> I come home, I'll have to like scooch my way through the door when I come home, but that's okay, right? Um, that means it went well, right? All right, anyway, anything else? Are we good? Everyone feeling clear? Okay, if you think of something, you can obviously ask me after, but I just want to make sure everyone is feeling good about all of that. And then um, we'll go back to this, right? So we'll go back where we left off. I kind of introduced the different categories of drugs, um, which again, isn't our focus. So we're focusing mainly on this. So um, as I mentioned last time, you can have like a short-term temporary uh, use of a substance, which we call being intoxicated, right? You drink alcohol or you use a medication of some kind or whatever it might be, you get like a short-term temporary uh, reaction to a substance. We're not so interested in that as much as we're interested in so a substance use disorder. And the way that this works is we we specify the substance. Okay, so we might say substance use disorder marijuana or substance use disorder cocaine or mixed if it's more than one drug. So we say that you have a substance use disorder and then we specify whatever drug or drugs that you are having a hard time with. In the past, we used to have two different disorders. It was kind of silly in a way. You could be substance abuse or substance dependence. But in the DSM-5, we combined them into one, which makes more sense because people who were abusing drugs were often dependent on it and vice versa. So with this disorder, you have quite a few different um, symptoms that signify that you're having a hard time quitting the use of a substance, right? You're becoming dependent on it in some way. So let's look at some of those symptoms. You have to have two or more and it has to be for at least 12 months. Okay, so that's a long period of time. We're not talking about like a short-term periodic use of a drug. We're talking about like over a year that you're having a bunch of symptoms that are interfering with your life in some way. So one of them is that you start taking it in larger amounts. So you start off small, but then you slowly increase the amount of it that you're taking over time, right? Or maybe you take it longer than you intended to take it. Like, oh, I was just gonna use this for a short time, but it becomes something that you take more and more of and for a longer period of time. Um, you have a lot of unsuccessful attempts to reduce. So maybe you want to stop, but you struggle to. You think about stopping, but you're not able to stop, right? So um, it's a lot of like unsuccessful efforts to control or reduce the amount of the substance that you're using which kind of goes hand in hand with the first one, right? That you end up taking more um, and more of it. There's a lot of time spent related to the drug. Time thinking about it, time acquiring it, time using it, right? There's a lot of time and energy trying to obtain, use, or maybe even recover from the substance. So it's taking up a lot of like time and energy in your life. You have a failure to fulfill major obligations. As a result of using the drug, right? So you're so hungover, you keep missing class in the morning, right? Or you are so like hungover that you can't get to work and like you're going to lose your job from it. But it's affecting your life. You're not being able to fulfill your responsibilities in some way. You continue to use it despite the fact that it's causing you problems. So despite the fact that you've gotten fired from work, you keep using it. Despite the fact that it cost you a relationship, you keep using it. Right. And again, they kind of all kind of go together a little bit here. They tend to be very common that people have much more than two. You have to have at least two of these. Um, let's see what else. Um, it puts you in situations that are physically hazardous or dangerous. Right, 
right? So you're putting yourself into circumstances that aren't safe as a result of using the drug. Maybe that is the actual use of it itself or using needles that might not be sterile or driving under the influence, which is obviously quite dangerous and dangerous to other people as well. Uh, you, let's see what else. There's like so many of them. You have a lot of craving, strong desire or craving of the substance. You think about it. It's on your mind, right? You want to use the drug. It's something that takes up a lot of that mental energy and time. We could also add that you have tolerance. Let me put these way up here. And withdrawal. Tolerance is when you need more and more of a drug to get the same effect. Which kind of piggybacks off this first one, right? Are you taking more and more of it? So let's say for months, you drink um, one cup of coffee in the morning. Like you drink like a tall cup of coffee from Starbucks. Eventually that tall coffee isn't going to have the same effect. And you go to a grande, then you go to a venti, and then you add shots to that, right? Like you have to keep adding more and more to get the same effect. It used to be that one, um, you know, one pill or one whatever, right, gave you a high and now you need two or three or maybe twice a day instead of once. And I have to tell you, I, I think I mentioned this last time too, that I worked at Starbucks for a couple of years when I was in graduate school, which was amazing because I was caffeinated for free um, and it got me through graduate school and it was amazing. I loved it. It was actually one of my favorite jobs I've ever done, but I felt like a drug pusher. Right. Because people would come in and they like looked all twitchy and they needed their, they needed their morning coffee and then they would get it and they'd be like, oh, you know, like just the happiness that would wash over them as I handed them their coffee. Like I felt like I felt like like a drug pusher. And then I would watch people like progress. Like I remember this one woman, like she started with a grande and then it was a venti and then it was a triple venti and then a quad venti. And we didn't have the trenta yet when I worked there. And you just watch people like slowly progress. And then it was like, she'd come back in the afternoon for a second coffee. And I was like, oh my gosh, I could see it happening. And I would feel so bad. But even something like as mild as coffee, right, can be something you develop tolerance to, right? If you take a sleep medicine every night to go to sleep, after a period of time, that same amount of sleep medicine doesn't work anymore. And you need more of it, right? And that's because your body becomes tolerant to it. It gets used to it. And it doesn't work anymore, so you have to take more. And then on the flip side of that, if you stop consuming or taking the substance, you feel awful, right? Like you get a headache. Even like one morning of not having a cup of coffee, if you drink it every day, and I'm just using coffee as an example because I think it's something we can all like more relate to, right? right I've, got our, I've got my water left. You have your coffee. You see a bunch of coffee. Uh, when you get a headache and you're tired or you're cranky or you don't feel the same because your body is used to having that drug in it, right? And so we tend to feel pretty lousy, which is why people don't wanna stop using the drug because they wanna avoid feeling withdrawal, right? And so it becomes this cycle that becomes really difficult to break, right? And people are getting themselves into trouble, they get into trouble with the law or dangerous situations, and it's affecting their life in some way. Any uh, stories or comments, questions, thoughts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some people are less like susceptible to like needing to go up. So it's nice that we have you. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with like, right? And there's nothing wrong with some of the substances that, you know, we can use, but it can be a problem for some people, right? Some people, it's wild. Everyone, again, responds so differently to medications, drugs, substances. Yeah. <laughs> Period and I'm on the so you were busy, <laughs> right? And that entire year, I would take like three of the big white bottles of hands like every day. I mean, not <clears throat> yeah, like so much. It like got me a new name on so many and everything. Like, it was like, yeah, it was ridiculous. It's wild what your body can become used to. Right. And then at some point when you go off of it, it's it's challenging as well. Right. It takes time to go off of that much like energy drink or, or whatever it might be. Anyone else? Any other like thoughts or comments or questions, stories, anything related to this? Again, we specify the substance. 
Right. The second one down here, it's a little bit different and this gets confusing. So do you remember when we, the very beginning of chapter four, when we were talking about anxiety disorders, I wrote two criteria for every single disorder on the board. One of them is that it causes significant distress and impairment. The other is it cannot be due to the use of a drug or a general medical condition. So most disorders cannot be due to the use of a drug. So if somebody has anxiety because they're using cocaine, we don't consider that an anxiety disorder, we consider it a substance disorder. And this is something that like, it's sometimes it's like, which came first, right? You have to figure that out. But if somebody has depression because they're abusing marijuana or anxiety and panic attacks because they're abusing a, a stimulant, we call that a substance-induced disorder. So let's say somebody, the classic example of this is schizophrenia. But somebody develops schizophrenia as a result of using a hallucinogenic substance. We would diagnose them with substance-induced schizophrenia, right? So it's specifically because of the substance. Now, uh, uh, sometimes when people stop a substance, the stuff goes away, but other times it can persist. So it could be that if someone's been abusing amphetamines or cocaine or like something like that for a long period of time, they might have anxiety the rest of their life as a result of abusing that drug, right? So this is the other way that this can manifest. Usually it's this. So we talk about substance use, you have a problem related to the drug, but if you have a disorder directly because of the use of a substance, we call it a substance induced disorder. So that's the one spot that it gets a little tricky, right? Maybe you have to figure out, does someone have panic attacks or anxiety um, and they're using a substance to help with that? Or did the substance cause the panic attacks and anxiety? And that's where it can sometimes get a little bit, a little bit tricky. Any other questions, thoughts, anything else here at all? Combining drugs makes things even more unpredictable. Right? And this is a popular thing to do. People love to combine substances together. Really easy example, like energy drinks and alcohol, right? Like Red Bull and vodka or whatever it might be. Like there's a bunch of these uh, combinations of, you know, medications or substances of some way. When we combine substances together, we get what's called a synergistic effect. Synergy means things working together to achieve like something greater than they could on their own. We talk about it a lot with group work, that people in groups can have a synergistic energy where they can accomplish more than they would be able to do by themselves. In pharmacology, what we say is when two drugs are both introduced into your system or two or more, that they can interact with each other in very unpredictable ways. So one example, um, of this, when you are on things like Xanax and Valium, you should never combine them with alcohol because it creates a very strong effect. I always think, uh, uh, is it Bridesmaids where she gets like a, a Xanax from, from Helen and then she drinks alcohol and she's like hallucinating people on the wing outside, right? Uh, you get this very unpredictable effect when you combine drugs together and it can be very dangerous. A lot of people, here's just a couple, right? A lot of people have died because they combined substances together, right? And some of these people, it's because of prescription medications, like Michael Jackson, like a lot of his like issues were related to prescription medications that interacted in a bad way. Other people, it was things like alcohol and different things that were maybe purposeful, some of them like kind of more suicide attempts. But you see a lot of people, and again, this is just a few, uh, that have died because of the interactions between drugs. When you combine two or more things together, it tends to get very unpredictable and it can wreak havoc on your system. A stimulant in an energy drink and a depressant in alcohol kind of creates a lot of tension on your heart. People get heart attacks because they don't realize how much they're consuming, right? And so it's really common to see issues. Maybe it doesn't cause death, but it can cause you to get violently ill or have problems. Like I shared with you, I got serotonin syndrome from cough medication um, and, a, and an antidepressant, right, together, right? And so like not realizing I accidentally created a synergistic effect in my system by taking cough medicine, right? So sometimes it's on purpose, sometimes it's on accident, but they create unpredictable effects. 
uh, some causes and treatments of substance-related disorders. Uh, very similar to what we were talking about with uh, eating disorders, it's kind of a combination of everything, right? And I think most disorders are that way, but we see it a lot here and with uh, eating disorders. Socioeconomic stuff live under stressful socio, right? That people use um, drugs as a coping mechanism to deal with stressful like circumstances or poverty and so on. Freud talked a lot about dependency. If you were dependent as a child, you become dependent on substances as an adult. If your needs weren't met when you were little, you might become dependent on a substance trying to fill those needs. Some like some support to that. Of all of his ideas, that one has a little bit more support. But if you feel a hole, you might be trying to fill that hole with substances or food or whatever it might be. From a behavioral and cognitive perspective, we talk a lot about conditioning. Drugs are very reinforcing. I think it takes something like two and a half to three and a half seconds from when you take a drag off of a cigarette for that nicotine to enter into your system and make you feel more alert and better. That is incredibly addictive, right? Let's say you drink a cup of coffee and you're up and you're ready to go, right? You take a uh, smoke pot before bed and you can sleep, right? All of those things are really rewarding and it can make it difficult to break the cycle. Right? And people become dependent on them because of that conditioning piece, right? Very, very common to see that. And then biologically, sometimes it is like a deficiency, right? There is a genetic component to substance disorders. But what we see a lot of is uh, maybe your reward center in your brain isn't functioning properly, right? And so we all have like a reward center in our brain, a dopamine rich pathway that produces feelings of like pleasure and happiness when it's uh, activated or stimulated. Sometimes people don't feel this the same way. And so they seek substances or like dangerous behaviors to feel what other people might feel a little more naturally. Right. So we can see that maybe there's like a reward center deficiency. There's a genetic component. It's probably again some combination of all of these, but it's really common to see like conditioning and like some of those things like that are up here fueling these different issues, right? Fueling dependency. In terms of treatment, it depends on which model we're like viewing it from, right? So Freud would say we need to go back to childhood, figure out what the dependency issues were and work through them. Very long, that would take forever, right? Um, Freudian therapy takes a very long time. But according to Freud, if you were dependent on a parent and didn't get your needs met, we have to go back and work through that. And once you've worked through that, maybe then the dependency on the drugs will get better. All right, so therapy is obviously one method. There are a couple of more like powerful, like more instant methods that are used. Things like aversion therapy. Very common if someone has conditioning taking place with a drug, then we have to make it unpleasant. Can you think of a way that maybe you can make a substance unpleasant so you don't want to take it anymore? Can like, you think of any ways we could do that? Just like overdoing it. Yeah, but right. that's like the old classic in the '90s. That was such a thing. Right, I'm going to have you smoke an entire carton of cigarettes until you feel sick and throw up and you'll never want to do it. Right, Not the best method as a side note, but it's kind of that like you overdo it, it loses its power. Right, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly what you're doing, right? Like uh, you are reversing the conditioning by making it like unpleasant in some way. That could be taste or it could be a drug. There are some things like for alcohol, for example, there's a medication that you can take that makes you violently sick whenever you drink alcohol. Now, the easy solution to that is if you want to drink, you don't take the medication, right? But people who have like a addiction to alcohol, they often will prescribe them this drug. I think it's called antabuse. Uh, and when you take the drug, it makes you throw up if you drink, 
Now, obviously you could get around that, but if the idea is that we're trying to pair it with something unpleasant so that you stop being rewarded when you take that drug. Right? So sometimes it's complicated to do, it depends on the drug, but it's reconditioning you. The very common method when it comes to like drug treatment. And then this one, if we do like CBT cognitive behavioral stuff, we do a lot of like, they call it behavioral self-control training, but it's a lot of journaling. It's a fancy name for journaling. What times of day are you drawn to smoke? Who are the people that you're smoking around? How do you feel before you smoke a cigarette? How do you feel after you smoke a cigarette, right? What are your triggers, right? Who are the people who are maybe triggers for you? What are your like risk factors? And then you take all of that and you try and apply coping strategies to it. Maybe you learn through journaling that like, okay, three o'clock in the afternoon is my low time. And I feel like I need drugs or I need some substance to get me through that time. And so how can we plan for three o'clock, right? Or maybe it's a group of people or whatever it might be. So um, journaling and then applying coping strategies to it. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just get somebody off of a drug. You have to detox, right? Detoxing from a drug is when you withdraw from it. And sometimes there are other drugs you can take that even block or change the way that you get off of a substance. So there are cases where sometimes people need to be hospitalized. If you are a heavy, heavy alcohol drinker and you quit cold turkey, it can actually kill you, right? It can be so dangerous to your system that you could die from it, right? Uh, some of the more difficult drugs to come off of are like heavy alcohol use. Nicotine, nicotine is the most addictive substance um, in production. And then also um, heroin. Heroin is another really, really challenging one to come off of because they affect our system so drastically. And so sometimes people need medical like supervision to do this. Maybe they're hospitalized for a period of time. Super controversial uh, things like heroin. Sometimes we give people a different drug to get them off the heroin. And you become addicted to methadone, which is like a substitute for heroin, but it's prescribed by a doctor, right? And it's monitored by a doctor, so it's a little better. But sometimes we'll even give people other medications to help them get off of one. And again, it's hard to come off of any drug. Like even we talked about antidepressants quite a bit a little bit ago. Like antidepressants take weeks to leave your system, right? They take weeks before you stop feeling those side effects. Um, and so you kind of learning to come off of it. And it's sometimes it's medically supervised depending on the substance because they can be dangerous to come off of really quickly. I think there's one more, but just to make sure any questions, anything for the moment, any questions, thoughts? A lot of movies about this um, coming off of drugs and medications and, and withdrawal and so on. <clears throat> People also go to things like AA and NA. Uh, AA and NA are like the very like self-help organizations with peer support and steps that you progress through. Very common that people go to NA or AA meetings to help them with substance dependence. And again, I just mentioned this, you might be hospitalized or go to a residential treatment center. There's a lot of substance uh, treatment centers in Hollywood area as we have a lot of like um, stars that get, uh, have addiction issues maybe that can afford to go to these very high-end places. But it's very common that people will be hospitalized, maybe just while they withdraw, right, to make sure that they're safe and that they're being monitored. Um, and then trying to prevent it, right? There's a lot of prevention efforts. My kids had like red ribbon week a few weeks ago at their school, right, trying to raise awareness about substances. My kids only cared about like, it was like crazy hair day. And I'm like, well, it's crazy hair day for a purpose, but they cared about the hair piece of it. But there's a lot of like prevention efforts of trying to teach people really young about the dangers of substances. How many of you, did anyone here um, grow up with like scare tactics related to drugs? Like if you take drugs, you'll die. Like it'll ruin your whole life and die. Some of you are, are nodding. I always think of mean girls with like, if you have sex, you'll get like an STI and die. Right? Um, but it's so true with, with substances, we have this like, if you use drugs, it will ruin your life. And then people go and they use a drug and it doesn't ruin their life. And all of a sudden there's no credibility there. So I think the newer methods are trying to just educate more than scare, but it's still a very common tactic, right? Scare tactics to keep you away from using substances. And what makes substances so scary is you just don't know how you're gonna to react to them. Again, everybody tends to react very, very differently.
Uh, what I want to do, as I mentioned, um, I have a little case study, and this is very similar to uh, the last one, um, but this is a young woman who is struggling with ecstasy. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to give this to you, but I'm going to, I'm going to make you do a little more group work last time. I think Monday, everyone was tired and wanting to work on their own, but um, I'm going to give you each one. And so read through it and then find a few people around you. And you're going to answer the three questions on the back, kind of pulling together everything that we just talked about. Um, feel free to like highlight and underline stuff that speaks to you. And I'm sure we'll talk about it. But you just need to turn in one per group with all of your names on it. And again, a true story. <laughs> so take a few minutes to read through it. And again, feel free to highlight or underline anything that like jumps out to you. And then you're going to be looking at symptoms and contributors and causes and treatments.
All right, so when you're done, again, find like two or three people, whatever's easy around you, and you can just bullet your answers, right? But what are some symptoms that she's displaying that are problematic? And I left this up here for reference. Um, what are some possible causes and contributors? There are lots of them. And then what are some options for treatment? You can think about what she did and what you might consider adding, uh, but get some bulleted thoughts down and make sure you write um, all of your names first and last on there too, because you are turning it in. So find like two, three people and get going on that. And then we'll talk about it together after you uh, go through it. <clears throat> I saw the next over to my jeans about the hair and it's about life. So we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can do it on your older one and just write my side more to see. Oh, yeah, we can do it on my I also have Sarah. It's fine. <laughs> Okay, what's the uh, sim symptom? What symptom for display that might indicate a substance use? Uh, she had a heart attack. Yeah. Oh, well, first one was having a heart Oh, I think she was sick. I think that was like maybe a step. Uh, <clears throat> I'm talking. No, it's since I fell. Oh, oh it. fell. Uh, she had a panic. Okay. Panic. Which can feel like a heart attack. <laughs> She also like started like increasing her message. Just talks to work actually. She like withdrew into herself. We came to the on Thursday. She's in the hospital. She's so, old man, so, 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 I feel it's almost like a scenario. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Uh, we have like five for number one. That would be for another like general you want you guys want to be one to number two? Yeah. Okay. Well, what are some of the possible problems of thinkers here to steer problematic other numbers from some She wanted to belong to her. So she soldier a new idea. Yeah, she also inspired three. Yeah, three. Yeah. Like that, but let's say maybe just like the next place. And then if there's some algebra number two, what's for the last one? Some you can go to a treatment facility, like in patient. So, you can't. 
No, no, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I put I put it as the second. I put it as the second I have room for one more, says. Just write, just write your name. How much does Just write down their names. Yes. Yeah. I want you to sing the name of her. I don't Yes. You can do that. I've written the I've written the longest way the most is the most is You have a song. And did you have me watch it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's usually what I do. I don't I don't I don't I I you're with the candles? Ten, yeah. I got three feet. That's, I think, the biggest thing in the No, so you really finished three seasons and now you're. No, I'm on the first season. I've been trying to watch it over. Yeah, Thankfully, I know like what part. Like, I think. I got the dullest eight minutes of the last you know, season. Like, it's not really relevant. It's not really I'm really just like for the summary. I'm just like cutting away like 90 percent filler. Did you already all of the 10 episodes of this? I just make sure that I have a list. I'm not going to start with the thing. I have a list of like the episodes. Can she at least like No, I don't remember it. I can't catch you to see it. I think you want to. Here's the only one. No, you can't. Once you look at the document, I can put up the one. Yeah, she's a cover. Does anybody need more time? Are we good? Feeling good? Okay, uh, let's talk about this together and then I'll collect them from you. So what are some of the symptoms? Anyone want to give me what's a what's a symptom that she showed that would make you think that she has a problem with ecstasy? What are some of the things you wrote down? What do you think? Yeah. Girl and going in so lost. Yeah. 
Okay, right. So she's losing that like interest and pleasure and activities that she's always enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's that continued use despite problems from it. I, I slipped in the time frame. In there. That's the one thing I changed. I added in 13 months to give you that time frame. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I stole your thought, right? Yeah, the time frame then, right? I'll give you credit anyway. Anybody else? Yeah, we'll go back to everybody. Yeah, more like having all these physical symptoms. It's affecting her sleep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, both, right? You see tolerance, withdrawal, anything else that you could add? There's a couple of other things that I've written down. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Dangerous situations. Yeah. I had a question. Sure. Is tolerance with drugs, it's not always a symptom of a substance use? Is it always a symptom of substance use disorder? It, I mean, it's something that our body naturally does. Mm -hmm. um, with any substance, right? Uh, so it's one of the things that can be a red flag. I won't say it's always problematic, but it can but be. You should typically be like, if someone's like, oh yeah, I've been to smoke triple what I usually do. Yeah, I mean, it's a sign that you're escalating, right? Like, and you used to smoke one cigarette, now you're smoking three or one, like, well, yeah, right here. Like, it depends, like you're you're escalating, which tends to be a red flag, might not be enough to be disordered, but it is something to keep an eye on. Other things? Anyone have anything else? Yeah. 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 Right. And that's that like time in pursuit of the drug and time related to it, like a lot of time uh, related to the drug. She gives up her friends and acting and auditioning, right? It's affecting like some of the things that she enjoys in her life, kind of like the, the pleasure piece that you talked about. So I think it would pr be pretty safe to say that she has a substance use disorder with ecstasy. What are some of the things that might be contributing? There's a lot of like environmental stuff in here. What are some of the things that might've contributed to her developing this problem yet? Yeah. yeah, right, wanting to fit in. It's a really big one. Peer pressure is a big one for people, right? And when it comes to substance use, what else, yeah? I think a really big one is that she just moved. Yeah. And she moved from a small rural town where everyone knew each other to a big city where people don't know each other. So maybe she felt lonely. Mm -hmm. And I think that might have played into why she wanted to play in so badly. And, yeah. Um, and I know that people with addictions, they use that substances to fill some void. Yeah. And that's a couple of things there, right? Feeling lonely, the move and change in environment, feeling, uh, you know, wanting to fill that void. Like those are all really powerful contributors. There was another kind of yeah. Right, right. You're meeting somebody who's selling it, your friends are using it, right? Of that environment and those influences are problematic. What are a couple anybody have anything else? I have a few more things here. Yeah. This might be a stretch, but it's like for the first bit of her life, she was always doing everything. So it seemed like she had a lot of drive and she was juggling a lot of stuff. And then since she was doing all that in a small town, she was like a big fish in a small pond. Sure. And then she moved to a big pond. So that might have been like, um, yeah. first of all, like doing a lot for so long might have caused the stress buildup. Mm -hmm. And then moving to a big pond from a small pond mm -hmm. as, a big, as a big fish might have made her feel like lesser than me. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't think that's a stretch at all, right? That could easily be it, right? Going from feeling like you're like, a big deal and that you're at the top to not feeling that way anymore because the pond is much bigger. Definitely. Right. I could see that. Anything else that you wrote down? Anyone have anything like um, in terms of like biology at all, for example? I wrote that on here or like conditioning. This is who you're nodding, right? Uh, she is that a hand? Sort of later she mentions she has a bunch of chemical imbalances that she has taken. Uh, other medications for yeah, you know, so we stay away from antidepressants, antipsychotics, and that's that. Mm -hmm. Your use, but would probably be for yeah. as well. Right, I like that. Like maybe thinking about that, or maybe she's not getting that rush naturally, so she's using it for that reason. And there might be some kind of like biological piece. She also mentions in there, all of us were broken in some way. Right. So there may be like some kind of underlying issue um, that might have driven it. And it just kind of comes out because of the environmental change. Uh, she goes through some treatments. But what are some of the things you wrote down 
uh, for treatment? What are some of the things that might uh, be helpful or that we could consider? So, yeah, I, I kind of have like a tandem of like medications and types of health and the right there. Okay. On the one hand, like medications, obviously, it's physical to help stabilize and get only to fill the best. But something along the line, I mean, you can go there to work on the very site. This is not to put yourself on the most stable path. Yeah, I like that, Brad. It's a good idea. Anybody else? Any other thoughts or things that you wrote down for treatment? Is that a hand? It was almost saying, you moved. If you move, I get excited. Um, I wrote down like the same thing that you just said. She could obviously go to a residential treatment center or consider like NA or AA. I think an environmental change is probably one of the biggest things that we could do to help her, along with journaling and things like that. Just the third thing, don't you think that we can sure. for her? Because she, part of what drew her in, at least by her account, is that peer pressure. So maybe a different group yeah. of collective. A different group under a collective goal, yeah, but with a more beneficial outcome mm -hmm. for the health of this person. Yeah, it does seem like she wants to be a part of a group one way or another. So, giving her that support um, might be really nice. That feeling of camaraderie and almost not alone with it, having other people, right? Uh, again, this is a you know, a real account. This is somebody's story that they shared. Uh, and I think it's a great way to kind of pull this in. This is kind of what you're doing in your paper, right? Like instead of this, you're looking at a TV or like a movie character and you're looking at what are all the different symptoms and signs, which we could call diagnostic criteria. What are the things that they're showing and how does it match up against what you have to have in order to have the disorder, right? So it's very similar in a way to what you're doing in your paper. Um, we'll practice that a little bit more uh, in one of the units later. We'll watch a, a film and we'll kind of do that with a character just to, again, give you the chance to be working on it. But uh, before you go today, so last chance for me to remind you, don't forget about the paper tonight, right? On Canvas, don't forget about the exam on Monday. I have an announcement that will go out Sunday night just to remind you that we don't have class in case you forget. Uh, but if you show up Monday, no one will be here. There'll be a sign on tour, but no one will be here. And then we'll be class Wednesday. And we'll be in college on Wednesday. So sorry, right? So again, I will eat something for each of you. Somewhere next week, you'll feel it, like a random croissant or something coming your way. Uh, make sure you turn that in before you leave. Have a wonderful spring break, uh, especially those of you who are going somewhere to travel safely. And I will see you. Uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right, bring those up. Make sure you turn them in before you go. And if you have any questions, I'll hang out for a minute as well. Yeah, what's up? Let me stop.